Thank you very much. Um, I wish to thank Tom and Nick for asking me to speak on this uh, obviously extremely successful and uh, an exciting meeting. Um, I was asked to speak about uh, diagnosis and management on non tubal ectopic pregnancies. Um, there's a little bit of history to this uh, lecture because initially it was actually Cheryl Kolf was asked to, to give this talk, <laughs> but, but Tom was uh, uncertain whether you would understand her, her northern accent. So, and all of you who know Tom, as long as I, he will realize that he doesn't put up with uncertainty for too long. So he decided to give a lecture to me. Um, could could Cheryl... <laughs> could have Cheryl given this lecture? I think yes, because this lecture is free of science. It requires an opinionated person and, and a certain uh, mindset which is well illustrated in the sentence from another thinker from the North. Uh, and, and, and I think these are all ingredients you need for this lecture. I think Cheryl would probably do better than me. But, uh, but let's go to the, to the topic. And, and we are going to talk about notubal ectopics. And uh, Tom has alluded already that these are rare problems. But because they are not uh, common, a lot of people are not familiar with diagnosis. So diagnosis is often missed or delayed. Clinical presentation can be severe. And they are associated with a disproportionately high maternal morbidity and mortality. And also, I always feel that we are compelled to do better with these pregnancies because most of them are actually man-made. They are a result of our actions, which usually involve surgery on the uterus or in the pelvis. What are we going to try to achieve this morning? Well, we try to define criteria to diagnose intrauterine pregnancy. Differential diagnosis of ectopic pregnancies we'll discuss to some extent, talk about clinical significance and principles of management. I'm going to stick with uterine ectopic pregnancies. The extrauterine are relatively easy and straightforward. There's not much to say about them. But this group is particularly important. These are the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in ectopic pregnancy in the UK. In order to diagnose an intrauterine ectopic, we have to be able to differentiate between pregnancy which is normally placed in the uterine cavity and one which is outside the cavity. And, and, and the problem is that when I talk to people, very few people can actually articulate how to diagnose intrauterine pregnancy. I'm not going to ask this question, but think about this. If somebody asks you, how do you actually diagnose intrauterine pregnancy, what would you say? Probably similar to session had this morning, how to diagnose miscarriage. Very few people can actually answer this question with confidence. And there are no rules in this, in this area. And if you look at the literature, nobody will define in any ultrasound book what intrauterine pregnancy is. And this is the definition I use, for better or for worse, but it covers all the possibilities. And, and I think intrauterine pregnancy is probably slightly obsolete in modern practice. We are talking about intracavitary or intraendometrial pregnancy. And to diagnose this pregnancy, it has to be located within the uterine cavity. <coughs> The trophoblast invasion not extending beyond endometrium mitral junction. It may sound odd to you that this is important, but you will see later on it is critical in assessing intrauterine topics. What is uterine cavity? Well, I believe uterine cavity is virtual space aligned with endometrium, which extends from the uterine ostea fallopian tubes to the internal os. So these are the boundaries where the pregnancy should be. If it's outside, it's an ectopic. To differentiate between different types of intrauterine ectopic pregnancies, you also need another friend, and your best friend is interstitial tube. Interstitial portion of the tube is a landmark, which defines boundary of the cavity, helps to define ectopics like interstitial ectopic pregnancy, and it's critically diagnosing pregnancies in uterine anomalies. In my practice and in, in my clinics, every scan starts with transfer section, which aims to identify both interstitial tube. This is the basic section which will help you to identify anomalies like septic uterus, subacorrent uterus, and particularly abnormalities of the uterus which are relevant to ectopic pregnancy. How can you see them? You can see them very easily. This is the B-mode scan. If you follow the top of the cavity, you will see tube in almost every woman with normal uterus. If you're spoiled enough, have 3D scanning as I am, you can use these uh, images to 
see tubes, and actually, in my practice, we do 3D scan of the uterus in everyone. Not because it's absolutely essential, but because it's very easy, it's very simple, it gives you many answers within a within very short period of time. And once you develop a habit of looking at inter inter interstitial uh, tubes, you're not struggling with problems like that. And, and, and you can easily say this pregnancy is ectopic because there is interstitial tube between the gestation sac and the cavity. This is intertrial pregnancy because there's wide communication between the cavity and the pregnancy itself. This is too busy slide to discuss, but this is the comprehensive classification which is included in your CD. And if you wish, you can read it and use it. But this helps you to work out differential diagnosis of all ectopic pregnancies affecting the uterus and tubal ectopic pregnancy. I will start with coronary pregnancy, which is actually, strictly speaking, not an ectopic pregnancy. It's pregnancy in the uterine cavity. Only the uterus is abnormal. Luckily, it's a relatively rare pregnancy, but it is uh, significant because it tends to present late. It tends to present with massive rupture, and there is significant maternal mortality associated with condition. I will diagnose it. It's very simple. If you see an ectopic pregnancy, if you haven't done it before, look at the uterus. You can see the uterus. You can see one tube. If pregnancy is outside the uterus, you have to consider a coronal pregnancy. Additional criteria, you can see the thick myometrium surrounding the pregnancy, and you will see vascular pedicle connecting um, uterus and gestational sac in this case. It's a diagnosis which is typically missed at the operation. It is fascinating. I, I've seen hundreds of women with unicornic uterus and non communicating cornea, and majority of a missed operation. The most extreme is the woman who had cesarean section recently in a big London teaching hospital, and she developed terrible pain afterwards. She had a massive hematoma, she had a little laparotomy, evacuation hematoma, and then she was recovering slowly. And she was sent to me to look what is happening in hematoma. And I look at the uterus. And in five seconds, I said, I know what happened to you. It was very easy. Why? Because she had the uterus without cesarean section scar. And she had the one tube. It was obvious she was one of the lucky few who had coronary pregnancy, progressing to term, and luckily ended up with delivery. But even at cesarean section, the diagnosis was not made. This is a video showing a, an example of advanced coronary pregnancy. Here is the uterus on the, on the right hand side. Uh, it's very hard to see. There's just one tube living there. But more importantly, you can see this massive gestational sac with the fetus. You see how sac is mobile. And this is what helps to differentiate between corneal and abdominal pregnancy. Abdominal pregnancy is typically stuck because it's secondary due to tubal rupture. But corneal pregnancy is free and mobile. And it's relatively easy to remove surgically if you have to do that. Sorry. So I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but just uh, for you to remember, coronary pregnancy is a rare form of ectopic pregnancies. There's a risk of uterine rupture. And also what is quite important in these cases, women with unicorn uterus and non-communicative cornea present in two different ways. Half of them will come with terrible dysmenorrhea starting from menarche and eventually diagnosed with endometriosis, retrograde menstruation, and have a surgery which is difficult. The other half have no symptoms <coughs> and they present with coronary pregnancy. The, the, the problem with this is that women who have coronary pregnancy in rupturing uterus will typically be clinically silent, because their peritoneum seems to be less able to respond as a pe to, to register pain when blood comes into the abdominal cavity. So you have to be very careful, because pain may not be warning of imminent rupture in these cases. Now we're going to move to interstitial pregnancy, which is the most dangerous ectopic pregnancy in this country. Why is it most dangerous? So if you look at the Confidential Inquiry UK 2000-2002, you will see the decision pregnancy was responsible for almost half of the, of the deaths with, 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 with ectopic pregnancy. And if you look at the summary of statistics from 2000-2008, 2.5% 2, 2 of ectopic interstitial roughly, and they're responsible for 20% of maternal deaths. Comforting feature is that after 2002, in the next inquiry, there was only one death of interstitial pregnancy, and the last inquiry, there were none. So hopefully, diagnosis is getting better, and we are diagnosing and removing this pregnancy before they rupture dramatically. Uh, how to diagnose interstitial pregnancy? Well, a lot of people follow Timur, and I follow Timur in many ways, but I think he is not right in this criteria. 
Ackerman from 1993 said that the visualization of interstitial part of the tube is the way to diagnose interstitial pregnancy, and I think he's right. And this is how you do it. This is the uterine cavity. You can see the endometrium, identify the tube, and there's pregnancy partially or completely within my metrium. And if you look on 3D scan, it's not essential, but makes it easy and simple. Here's the tube and pregnancy. And if you, if you just want to look at 2D scan, again, it's relatively straightforward. You look at the corner of the uterus, you can see the tissue <coughs> tube, and there's a pregnancy there. How do you manage the tissue pregnancy? You can do all sorts of things, expectant, the systemic tricks, it, local metric tricks, it, and so on. The principle, in my opinion, is, is relatively simple. In the modern practice with advanced laparoscopy, uh, interstitial pregnancy becomes more surgical disease than it was 10 years ago. But every pregnancy deserves individual assessment. You have to look at the location of the pregnancy. So pregnancy which is closer to the uterus is less likely to rupture. It's more difficult to remove surgically and easier to manage medically. So generally, the smaller the pregnancy is and closest to the uterus, it is better to consider medical treatment. The further pregnancy from the uterus, the larger it is, so it is a better option. The other factor which is important is the speed. If you need patients to recover quickly, for example, IVF patients, which are often presenting with interstitial pregnancy, and they need to use their frozen eggs, they are 39, and they need to move on quickly, then surgery is oh, your best option. Because with medical treatment, uh, recovery is, is prolonged and, and sometimes extremely frustrating. How do you manage conservatively? Well, this is algorithm we use in our, our hospital. If there is a heart rate, we give local methotrexate plus KCL to stop heart rate, and then pregnancy deteriorates and disappears. Local methotrexate always works if you put it in the right place, uh, as opposed to systemic, which is, which is often ineffective in these pregnancies. If pregnancy is is not viable and ACG is dropping, we tend to manage expectantly. ACG levels are of some importance. If ACG is very low, you're almost certainly going to get away with this. If ACG is above 9,000, there is a mixed bug and failure uh, risk is, is higher. We manage these women in outpatient clinics. And what do you do? Well, you, you give them a little bit of uh, analgesia. You go to anterior fornix with the needle, you can see small pregnancy here. It's very small, but ACG was 2,500, and this is the one which will grow very fast. You advance needle into the pregnancy, and, uh, and you give them a little bit of local methotrexate, and that problem is solved. Such a small pregnancy will resolve very quickly, and women will be able to return to normal in no time. The problem with medical treatment, like any medical treatment of non tubal ectopic, is time. <coughs> So people often report, well, we give methotrexate, which is a fantastic drug, and its ACG drops down to six, and all is nice and beautiful. But that's just part of the problem. Because the other problem is what to do with the body. And the body stays there for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And women who want to have IVF will go to fertility specialist. And fertility specialist, if there's anything remotely possible to be abnormal, they will say, no, 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 you can't have treatment. This is very dangerous for you. have a dead trophoblast in the uterus, and they wait sometimes nine months, sometimes a year for this pregnancy to go away. So, so medical treatment has a, an important disadvantage of a, of, of, of a long time required to recover. Uh, the other is um, surgery, and laparoscopic surgery has become more widespread, and it's an excellent treatment for, for ectopic pregnancy, particularly interstitial. The problem with uh, laparoscopic surgery is that people tend to use the same thinking as they used in the past with laparotomy. A lot of people are desperate to cut into the uterus to remove part of my metrium with the pregnancy, just in case there's some trophoblast left behind. This is the problem, because cutting into the uterus causes bleeding, increases the risk of complications, and also leads weakness in the uterus for the future, which can cause uterine rupture. So what we tend to advise is if you have a decision pregnancy, we, we, we tend to use a simple loop, put it as close to the uterus as possible, remove the trophoblast, and remove the decrease the volume of pregnancy, and if anything is left behind, we give local methotrexate to treat it very promptly. So, so that's the approach we use at, at UCH. Of course, people will disagree with me, but again, I think that critical importance in surgery of ectopic pregnancy is not to damage the uterus. There's no need for that. So just briefly, uh, these are the, the, the key messages which you have on your CDs. I'm not going to uh, 
bore you uh, reading this uh, in great length, but just to, to reiterate once again, surgery, I think, is a better option in women with large distal pregnancies who need to move on with the fertility as soon as possible. Also, if women comes with pain, it's a better prognostic sign and it's better to operate and manage medically. Uh, the group which is becoming very popular these days, uh, cervical uh, and cesarean scar pregnancies. This is entirely man-made. In scar pregnancy, it's always easy to establish this is caused by cesarean section. In cervical pregnancy, it's not so easy, <coughs> because I believe very firmly that cervical pregnancy is almost always caused by difficult dilatation and, and false passages in women, particularly young women having abortions. But not many women volunteer information they had abortion, maybe when they were 15 or 16. And this is an example. This woman came to see me with the cervical pregnancy, which is clearly in the back of the uterus. So you would expect false passage to happen. And I asked her, have you had any abortions before? I said, no, 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 never. Are you sure? Absolutely never. And I was looking at her file, which showed that five years earlier she came for scan and she was counseled for termination of pregnancy. So you have to be careful because sometimes women will not tell you that abortion um, has happened. But, but if you have a cervical pregnancy, if uterus is unperverted, it will be typically in the back of the uterus where false patch tends to occur. If uterus is retroverted, it will be typically in front of the uterus. That's a very, very simple rule, which indicates indirectly that perhaps surgical trauma is the main cause. Scar pregnancies are, 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 are more commonly diagnosed these days because we have more cesarean sections, so we're better picking them up. And uh, some people argue, say, what is scar pregnancy? This is a... Uh, this is product of somebody's imagination. It's not ectopic pregnancy at all. <coughs> well, if you accept the definition of ectopic pregnancy as pregnancy outside the uterine cavity, there's no question that this is an ectopic pregnancy. Uterine cavity is here. This pregnancy is deep in the myometrium outside the cavity. And also, in some cases, you will see pregnancy actually extends outside the uterus, can invade bladder, and cause terrible, terrible complications during, during pregnancy management. So I think it's an ectopic pregnancy par excellence. Why does it happen? Well, it happens because cesarean section scar heal very poorly. Why do they heal very poorly? We don't know why. But if uterus is retroverted, they're much more likely to heal poorly because of the tension, I suspect, on the lower segment. But the efficient scars are very common. The statistics vary. In my population, about 10 to 15 percent. I think Lil Valentin will tell you about 20, 30 percent. So it depends what definition you use. But, but weak scar is a common problem. Um, what is the prevalence? The prevalence is not very high, about 1 in 2,000. So why is it so low? Because the, the condition for implantation in this area are very poor. There is no decidua. So although I think pregnancies very often venture in this area, they fail because they cannot develop in this uh, virtual desert in, in, in the uterus. Um, uh, if you look at population women with cesarean section, the prevalence is about 1 in three to 400. In women who had two or more sections, one in 50, so quite, quite common in, this, in these cases. How do you diagnose it? Well, pregnancy has to be implanted anteriorly into defect at the presumed site of cesarean section, and this is an example of pregnancy. This is a cavity. You can see gestational sac, embryo. You can see placenta typically shows lakes and degeneration. There is no myometrium covering this placenta. So this placenta is, is deep in the anterior wall of the uterus. Uh, just one more picture. You see embryo, which is alive. And these are difficult cases to manage because you see a woman who has wanted pregnancy, a live embryo, and you're telling her something terrible can happen. And she looks at you in disbelief and says, I'm not sure I trust you. Diagnosis is not always straightforward. And these are three cases which I referred to my hospital recently with, uh, with suspected scar pregnancy. Anybody wants to have a go? Are they all scar pregnancies? None of them? Most of them? Some of them? Anybody? Are they all scar pregnancies? The old women had cesarean sections, and you can see this is a longitudinal section of the uterus in all three cases. Well, as Lil will tell you, there are not many applications of Doppler gynecology, but this is one which Doppler is of absolute critical importance. And when you use Doppler, you will see this pregnancy. Here is deficient scar, but the trophoblast is overlying the scar placenta is implanted in the back. This is not a scar pregnancy, this is intrauterine pregnancy. This pregnancy here, here is a scar, but placenta is up here. This is a miscarriage where pregnancy is partially expelled into the cervix, and Doppler tells you there is no implantation of the scar. Well, this one here, it's the proper one, 
you can see the vascular supply around the sac. So without Doppler, you cannot differentiate between scar pregnancy, a low implantation, and a, and a miscarriage. What has happened to these pregnancies? Well, most of them luckily undergo spontaneous dissolution. Vast majority fails in the first trimester. Some fail in the second trimester, and a small number progresses to placenta previa accreta, which is an obstetric nightmare. And if it can be avoided, I think uh, we should make every effort to avoid it. Tom has already alluded to these figures. This is last confidential inquiry. Three women died of second trimester scar pregnancies. And if you look at mor mortality and prevalence, cesarean scar pregnancy is 10 times more likely to kill women than tubalotopic pregnancies. But mortality is just a small part of the story. Morbidity with condition is absolutely massive. Women with tubal pregnancy, we have a laparoscopy, and they go home happily. These women can spend months and months in hospital, have hysterectomy, have massive transfusions, and fight for their lives for weeks and weeks. Do we have any proof that uh, early implantation the scar evolves into placenta previa accreta? Yes, we have. This is the case I showed a few times before. A woman who was diagnosed with scar implantation at four weeks tends to progress to seven, nine weeks. You, you see herniation of placenta into the nexa, and as, as it approaches the term, you will see typical feature placenta accreta uh, previa, and she has cesarean section hysterectomy because of massive bleeding. How can you manage these pregnancies? Well, there is a Again, massive number of options in the literature. I can assure you I tried them all. And uh, after trying them all, I have decided the only way to manage them in early pregnancy is surgical management. And surgical management involves the evacuation of pregnancy. But the problem is, uh, is, is hemostasis, because you're removing pregnancy from deficient myometrium, which has no ability to contract. So basically, when you take the placenta out, there's a massive area from which bleeding tends to, tends to continue. So the only way to stop the bleeding is to contract the uterus, often with mazoprostol, and close the exit by putting cervical suture. So create high pressure environment, which is very effective achieving hemostasis. We've been doing this now for 10 years, for both cervical pregnancies and scar pregnancies. This is just a snapshot of our practice. And if you look at these figures, blood loss on average is 50 mils, not very high. But if you look at the cervical pregnancies more than nine weeks, every single one have a blood loss more than 500 mils. So earlier you operate them, better. Transfusion rates are very low with cervical suture. Retained products surprisingly low, only 4%, and none of women in our population so far had a hysterectomy or uterine perforation. This is our management algorithm, very simple. If the pregnancy is non viable, less than seven weeks, we do it in outpatient clinic now. We have a manual suction of evacuation, we take it out. If it's more than seven weeks, we do it in theater with a cervical suture. It wouldn't make sense to remove these pregnancies if future is bleak for these women, but luckily it is not. And these are figures from our study which show that majority of women who decide to become pregnant after successful removal of scar pregnancy are able to do so, and risk of recurrence is only 5%. So if you remove this pregnancy very early, a woman is likely to conceive again and um, have a pregnancy in the future. I have to hurry up now because my time is uh, running out. But generally, these are conclusions. Again, you have them on your on your, on your uh, CD, and although, as I say, optimal management is unclear, I firmly believe that surgical evacuation is the best. And now I'm going to bring you to the most exciting, most mysterious, and uh, the cleverest atopic pregnancy um, that we are facing in our practice every day. And there she is. Yeah, can you see it? Excellent pregnancy? Can you see? Well, I scanned this woman endlessly week after week after week. And I was nearly on the phone to George Condor to say, George, I take it all back. Persistent PL do exist. Because I couldn't find pregnancy here. But eventually I decided one day to use Doppler. And there it is. There it is, a small pregnancy in the back of the uterus with ACG of 1,000. And now we can all see it, yeah? Once you know it is there. So this is the problem which uh, I thought was very rare. In the mural pregnancies, I used to see only once in the blue moon, but in the last year, I saw five. And it's always, uh, um, as it is in the practice, the more you look for things, you're more likely to see them. Uh, 
the obvious differential diagnosis is from a molar pregnancy. But molar pregnancy will have a preceding history of, of, of mole, and you have invasive mole in the uterus. And also, HCG levels in molar pregnancy tend to be higher. But this is the record from our intramural pregnancies when the levels of HCG are very slow and static. In that particular case, I also took a histological sample to make sure she hasn't got trophoblastic disease. If a woman has trophoblastic disease, she goes to Charing Cross, and they are treated with 10 times the methotrexate and, and, and all sorts of medication. And this women don't need, don't need anything, perhaps from very small local injection of methotrexate. Why is intramural pregnancy challenging? Well, it is most difficult to diagnose. Trophoblast invasion uh, occurs within myometrium, so there is a possibility of bleeding if you remove it surgically. The location is variable, so there are no rules. You can't say, this is the way I diagnose it. And the fresh diagnosis, as I said, includes trophoblastic disease. Management is conservative. Why? Because you usually cannot remove them surgically. They are too deep in the uterus. And there are a few examples for you. This is a woman who came at a 10 week gestation. You can see the uterine cavity here and pregnancy completely embedded in the right side of the uterus. This is the woman who had an unsuccessful two year PC. So you can see the cavity here. You can see trophoblast <coughs> deep in the myometrium. Another pregnancy with the communication of the cavity deep in the myometrium. Another one penetrating at the medial myometrial junction. So I will finish this um, by saying that uh, ultrasound in ectopic pregnancy has evolved from simple detection of intrauterine pregnancy to suspicion of ectopic pregnancy in absence of normal intrauterine pregnancy. We move to direct visualization of ectopic. In modern practice, what we're doing, we are looking at ectopic, we are analyzing demographic, biochemical, morphological characteristics, and make rational decisions about management. As far as non tubal ectopics are concerned, you can reach diagnosis in most cases if you know how to scan. And it's important to remember if you're not sure, do not leave it. Because the longer you leave it, the problem is likely to become more worse if a woman indeed has, a, has non tubal pregnancy. I think generally that surgical treatment is preferable to medical whenever possible. And I think if you have these problems, if you see them very early, whatever you do, you're going to be fine. A pregnancy which is more than eight weeks gestation, I think you should discuss with somebody in your regional center. Thank you very much for your attention.